People have this frustrating habit of quitting before they start. I hear it most often with art. They'll say, I suck at drawing, even though they've drawn two things in their entire life. As a professional editor and writer, I've noticed that the same goes for writing. Writers burden themselves with the expectation of producing a publishable novel on their first attempt. Writing can be an innate talent, but it's also a skill that must be cultivated through deliberate practice, patience, and perseverance. That's why I want to provide ways for you to overcome these 10 common mistakes I've seen new writers make. Number 1. Treating writing advice as if it's set in stone. Some writers take all writing advice to the extreme and overcorrect. Oh, adverbs are bad? Then I'll never use an adverb in my writing ever again, and when I'm critiquing other people's stories, I'll be sure to cut all the adverbs. On the other extreme, some writers get huffy and go, This advice doesn't work for me, so it's trash. Saying all writing advice is bad is like giving a one-star review to a dry cleaner you've never visited because you prefer to wash your own clothes. Experienced writers understand that almost all rules of writing are actually guidelines that can be adjusted depending on the writer's objectives. They also realize that just because certain writing advice doesn't apply to them doesn't mean it won't be useful to someone else. All writing advice is more nuanced than it appears on the surface. A lot of the pushback against common writing tips comes from misunderstanding the original intention of the advice. Adverbs are generally disliked because they're redundant or wordy, like writing, he walked arrogantly, instead of, he sauntered. Yet I've seen people change sentences like, he walked arrogantly, to, he walked with arrogance, because they think all adverbs should be avoided. They don't realize it's the elimination of weak phrasing, not adverbs, that the advice is targeting. Plenty of acclaimed authors use adverbs for poetic effect. Most writing advice exists for a reason, but you need to understand the underlying problem the advice is trying to fix in order to determine if it applies to you. In the same vein, everyone's writing journey is different, and there's no single right way to be a writer. Key takeaway. Writing advice is always subjective. There are no absolutes, just options. Number two, being unable to convey a cohesive story concept. Stories that have stood the test of time can often be summarized in a single sentence. A scientist creates an artificial man, but then wants to destroy his creation. A colony of rabbits escape their doom worn and struggle to find a new home. It's easy to capture the book's essence. New writers sometimes struggle to articulate what their novel is about. But learning to capture the story's core idea is an important skill. If the concept sounds too unfocused, vague, or boring, that probably means the draft itself is flawed in the same way. The story doesn't need to be a high-concept epic. It can be quiet and character-focused, like the Watership Down example. You just need to point to one star in the larger story constellation, showing what shines brightest about your novel. When someone asks you the dreaded question of, well, what's your book about? You'll be able to confidently say, it's about a pair of identical twins in a small town, and one of them gets murdered. Or, it's a coming-of-age story about a poet fighting racism in 1960s Los Angeles. You can practice writing these elevator pitches for your favorite books or movies, and then apply the same distillation strategy to your own stories. Key Takeaway Know how to sum up what your character wants in one sentence. Number three, writing a novel like a bad movie. The story reads like an amateur screenplay. It's mostly dialogue with lifeless prose. The characters are based on archetypes we've all seen before, like the hard-boiled detective or the femme fatale. And the plot feels like recycled melodrama from various blockbusters. This problem usually happens when the writer hasn't read much fiction, so they don't have a feel for how the writing style can shape the reader's experience, or how to pace a scene on a sentence level. Writers don't need dense, description-filled prose to tell a good story. Still, it's useful to know the different effects certain word choices and sentence structures can create, rather than treating the prose as a means to an end. Writing style is the equivalent of a film's cinematography, 
It contributes to the tone and atmosphere. When reading a good novel, try to dissect a page on a sentence level to see what techniques other authors have used. Certain genres of fiction like action, mystery, or conversation-based literary novels can be more dialogue heavy. But if you have a scene that's mostly dialogue, make the characters do some other task while they're talking, or incorporate an interesting setting so that it doesn't feel like the conversation is happening in a white room between talking heads. Movies have the advantage of already being a visual medium. In books, writers can add more sensory layers, as well as the characters' thoughts and feelings. If the characters and plot feel drawn from overused Hollywood tropes, it can dilute the story's believability and originality. So dive into real human psychology and brainstorm ideas beyond what you're used to seeing in fiction media, and you're less likely to get a watered-down story. Key takeaways for preventing bad movie novels. Study the sentence-level writing style of authors you admire. Add actions, sensory details, or internal commentary to dialogue-heavy scenes. Take inspiration for characters from real life, not stock roles. Number four, creating inconsistent or undefined characters, particularly main characters. One second she's brave, the next she's a coward. He's described as talkative, yet he doesn't have much dialogue. The reader can't get a sense of what adjective best fits the character. Contradictions give characters depth and complexity, but if their personality isn't anchored by a single core quality, it can make them feel flat. Inconsistent characterization springs from situations where the characters are doing what the plot requires of them, rather than steering the plot with their own personal desires. That's how stories end up with characters making stupid choices that don't fit their personality. They're taking risks not because of their risk-taking personality, but because the author wanted to shove some conflict into the story. In the same vein, undefined characters are the result of the author not knowing enough about their literary children. Every person in the story feels interchangeable because their reactions, emotions, and interests are entirely predictable. Like the hero who always sacrifices himself, or the villain who kills for fun. This also connects to the problem of characters who can do no wrong, often called Mary Sues or Gary Stews, who easily overcome all obstacles. Oftentimes, they have no internal lack, which means there are no opportunities for them to grow or change across the course of the novel. Readers can't relate to perfection. Writing character profiles can help shape them into distinct figures rather than generic molds. You can write a page of backstory about their family, friends, and relationships, their deepest insecurities, their guilty pleasures, what they would do during a bank robbery or with an annoying salesperson. Anything that makes them interesting as a person. Not all of these details will make it into the story, but they'll color the way you write about the characters. Interviewing your characters can also be a fun exercise to help you get inside their thought process. Ask them tough questions like, What's a memory you wish you could erase from your mind? Write out their responses to get a feel for their voice. I often keep a piece of sample dialogue on hand for each character to use as a guide for their distinctive speaking styles throughout the story. Get to know people in real life. Read memoirs, autobiographies, and biographies. Analyze the contradictions that form a person's identity. What makes them feel like real people? Give your characters that same level of depth. Key takeaways for creating three-dimensional characters. Have their goals and desires steer the plot. Write a mini-biography for each character. Interview your characters and ask them tough questions. Use a sample piece of dialogue to pinpoint their voice. Number five, failing to make the reader feel the emotions of the story. This problem connects to a lot of different issues, namely a lack of detail, characterization, and narrative voice. The reason show don't tell is such common writing advice is because showing helps readers feel what the characters are feeling. In first drafts, writers might rely on emotional shorthand, like her sister was scared. We see the narrator's conclusion about what to label the emotion, but not the evidence of what proves it's true. Maybe her sister is trembling so hard her skinny knees are knocking together, or her sister outright says, It's too scary. 
the writer must give the reader the information that allows them to come to their own conclusions. Author and YouTuber Shaylin Bishop has called this Describe, Don't Explain, which I think is a great alternative to show, don't tell as a principle. New writers also tend to write in general terms instead of using specific details, missing opportunities for stronger emotion. Rather than a teenager just listening to music on his headphones, he might be listening to old school jazz, which tells us something about his personality. Perhaps he is an old soul. Narrative voice is about painting the scene in a way that oozes a particular feeling. In her fantasy novel, The Starless Sea, Erin Morgenstern builds an atmosphere of magic and mystery around a door painted on a wall. A golden, seemingly three-dimensional doorknob shimmers despite the lack of light. A keyhole is painted beneath, so dark it looks to be a void awaiting a key, rather than a few strokes of black paint. Pinpoint the emotions you want readers to feel, and use your word choices, sentence structure, and rhythm to create that effect. How you say it matters almost as much as what you say. Key takeaways for conveying emotion. Show feelings through the character's words and actions. Use carefully chosen details rather than generic descriptions. Employ a strong narrative voice that evokes a specific emotion. Number six, head hopping or not understanding the difference between third-person omniscient and third-person limited point of view. Head hopping is when the writer reveals the thoughts and feelings of multiple characters in a scene in a way that's jarring to the reader. I call this unintentional third-person omniscient because new writers don't often realize what's wrong with this approach. And there is a very fine line between head hopping and omniscient point of view. Head hopping can be a useful literary technique, but it takes skill to pull off. If you do it right, the reader won't even notice it. But if you do it wrong, it can take the reader out of the story and hurt the flow. A quick refresher on point of view. First person and third person point of view are essentially the character perspective you're using to tell the story. For first person, you'd use the pronouns I, me, and my to show what the main character is doing. I kick down my door. In third person, you'd use the pronouns he, she, or they when describing the main character's actions. She kicked down her door. The not often used second person features the pronouns you and your. Third person point of view is further divided into limited and omniscient. With limited following closely to one character per scene or chapter, and omniscient using a distant narrator who is not usually an active character in the story. Some novels blur the line between limited and omniscient, so it's totally normal to be confused by the distinction. So what does head hopping typically look like? Haley wanted nothing more than to slap some sense into her wretched sister. Indeed, this was one annoyance too many. What are you doing? Kaylee flinched. Why was Haley so pissed off? It was no big deal. At first, it seems like we're in the third person limited perspective of Haley because the narrative is phrased in her voice, with the sentence, Indeed, this was one annoyance too many. But then we slip into Kaylee's thoughts in the sentence, Why was Haley so pissed off? The problem is that the story doesn't feel like it has one distinct narrative voice throughout. The switching levels of closeness between characters seems accidental, not purposeful. When writing in third person limited, it can help to imagine your writing in first person, only able to see and know what the point of view character can. If you want to write in third person omniscient, establish the external narrator early on and give a big picture view of the story. This will signal to the reader that the narrative is using a wider lens. Only changing your viewpoint character after scene or chapter breaks can also help you avoid accusations of bad head hopping. Key takeaways for avoiding unintentional head hopping. Study novels labeled as third person limited or omniscient narratives. Develop a strong sense of your narrative voice. Stick with one character's perspective per scene or chapter if you're not confident in your writing yet. Number seven, unintentionally repeating plot points or phrases. Our brains are lazy. They're constantly looking for shortcuts to save energy 
And that involves pulling from the same well of ideas over and over, instead of digging deeper. A story probably doesn't need five different scenes where the protagonist is running away or arguing with their dad. Cutting out repetitive scenes will make the story feel more focused and less predictable. The lifeblood of storytelling is change. Repetition can work if it's intentional, and the outcome is different than previous times, as in a try-fail cycle. This is when the protagonist fails to hit the target several times in different circumstances, but after they've gained more experience, they try again and succeed. The characters fail and succeed in unpredictable ways, which keeps the story fresh and interesting. Unintentional repetition also happens on a sentence level. The language becomes too predictable, like in this terrible description I wrote just for you. Her words hit him like a ton of bricks, and he hit the wall with his fist. It hurt his hand, and he tried not to wince at the blood on his hand. Clichés such as hit him like a ton of bricks are basically repetitions of common phrases, and you likely predicted how the phrase would end before I'd even finished saying it. Hit and hand are also repeated within the same sentences. The syntax, the sentence structure itself, is identical too, tying together two clauses with and. Readers crave variety, and it's that feeling of not knowing what will come next, even on a line level, that drives them to keep reading. To eliminate the repetition, I could use more creative verb choices, along with different syntax for the second part. Her words choked all sense out of him, and he jabbed his fist into the wall. Though his knuckles stung and blood trickled down his fingers, he didn't wince. That description is four words shorter than my original version, despite providing more information. As with repeated scenes, language repetition can be powerful and poetic when it's intentional. Repeating a certain phrase at the beginning of a sentence is a rhetorical device called anaphora, and it's often used in poetry and speeches, but it's popular in fiction as well. Editor Louise Harnby gives a great example. See that heap of corpses in there? That's why I do this job. That's why I come home late. That's why I forget birthdays and anniversaries. Those people's lives were stolen from them. And it's my job to get justice for them, said Grimes. The writer is trying to add emphasis and emotional weight through repetition. Learn to identify patterns in your own writing. If you're repeating yourself, make sure you have a reason for doing so. You can distill each scene into a one-sentence summary and see if any seem repetitive on the surface. Reading aloud as if you have an audience will help you catch unintentionally repeated words or phrases. Push your brain harder instead of taking the easiest path. Key takeaways for catching accidental repetition. Examine each scene at a big picture level to see if any are too similar. Replace cliches with fresh language. Read your story aloud to check for repeated words and phrases. Number eight not knowing enough about the story's genre or audience. Some writers will hand me their manuscript and say something like, here's my young adult horror novel. But when I read the book, I see that the main character is 10 years old and the horror involves a friendly ghost. So really it's a middle grade fantasy novel, since young adult features teen protagonist and the presence of a ghost doesn't mean it's horror. Sometimes writers insist that their book is a mix of several different genres and it will appeal to readers of all ages. That might be true, but most readers want a general idea of what to expect, and literary agents need to know the specific genre and audience in order to successfully pitch the book to publishers. So choose the book's primary genre, and the age range of readers who will most enjoy the story. If a book features magic, its primary genre is probably fantasy. If it features a 29-year-old protagonist, adult readers are likely the target audience. Also, it's important to know the average word count for your genre, especially if you're going the traditional publishing route. Some new writers make the mistake of sending off a 300,000 word epic that scares off literary agents, or typing the end on a 20,000 word book and calling it a novel. Most publishers prefer debut novels to be over 40,000 words and under 100,000 words, but it really depends on your genre and intended audience. Books for middle grade and young adult readers, for example, will generally be shorter. 
and certain genres like epic fantasy and historical fiction might go way over that word count. It's important to remember that established authors play by different rules than first-time authors, and they don't have the same word count constraints because they've already proven that their books will sell. Also, these word count guidelines might change over time. So look at the length of recently published debut novels in your genre and market. Most of us would like to just write a book and have someone else take care of the marketing and selling aspects. But the reality is that if you want to succeed in the publishing world, you need to be as well versed in the business side of writing as the craft side. This means learning industry lingo and understanding how the publishing process works, whether you're going the traditional route, a small press, or self-publishing. And knowing what defines those paths is an important starting point. Even if you're self-publishing, you need to be aware of readers' expectations. Authors can and should subvert familiar tropes, but if you advertise your book as a romance and there aren't many kissy moments, your readers might be disappointed. Your cover and blurb should also convey the right genre, so you can attract the readers who will most enjoy your book. Book marketing is always a balancing act between fitting in and standing out. Familiarity and novelty. Consuming recently published works in your genre can help you understand the current trends and reader expectations for that genre. Trends come and go, and often what you're reading doesn't reflect where the market is headed, but it will give you a general feel for what sells and what ideas have been overdone. I like to study positive and negative book reviews for genres I'm editing or writing so that I can pinpoint readers' favorite elements and pet peeves. You can also keep an eye on the big buzz titles by signing up for newsletters from bibliophile havens like Publishers Weekly, Shelf Awareness, Book Riot, Literary Hub, and Goodreads. Being familiar with the books currently flying off the shelves and how they're categorized in terms of genre and audience can help you figure out where your book fits. Key takeaways for categorizing your novel. Decide on your book's primary genre and audience. Understand what readers generally expect from a novel in that genre. Read books published within the past five years. See what readers like and dislike in their reviews. Sign up for book-related newsletters. Number nine, being impatient and underestimating how much revision a publishable novel requires. Too many new writers revise their book twice, slap a cover on it, and call it finished because they want to move on to the next thing and they end up submitting or publishing subpar work when they could have made it so much better. Countless authors have told me that they rushed to self-publish their first novel, and then regretted it a few years down the line after working on other projects and learning more about writing. Getting feedback from other writers and waiting a few months before revising are crucial steps in creating a professional tier story. There are two specific strategies I use to overcome that mental resistance to waiting and revising. The first is, don't compare your first draft to someone else's final draft. All those books you see on the shelves, they've been edited by multiple people and likely went through several rewrites. I often count the number of names mentioned in a book's acknowledgement section, and sometimes it's upwards of 20 people who have read, edited, consulted on, or discussed the book before it was published. It truly takes a village to raise a novel. That leads into the second strategy, Find other people who give a crap about you. Some writers seem to think that if their book doesn't come wholly from them, then it'll be in some way tarnished or tainted by outside influence. But the truth is, oftentimes the difference between a mediocre novel and a good one is whether the writer used feedback to refine their craft. Professional editors can be excellent teachers, but you can also find help from critique partners and beta readers. Build a support group of like-minded writers and readers who will critique your work regularly. These are people who will see the potential in your writing and encourage you to keep improving. They actually understand your genre and style and what you're trying to achieve with it. You can trust them with your first drafts before you send it off to strangers who don't care about demolishing your feelings. The more practice you have with receiving critique, the better you'll know how to differentiate between feedback that enhances your vision for the story and feedback that detracts from it. Giving critique to other writers will also sharpen your writing and self-editing skills. Few writers poop gold on the first try, so revise, revise, revise. Key takeaways for being a more patient and successful writer. 
Don't submit or publish your first drafts. Wait a few weeks or months between edits. Find kind and reliable critique partners and beta readers. Trust your own vision for the story. Develop a revision process. Number 10. Having unrealistic expectations about how publishing works. Most of us dream about our novel earning six figures and getting adapted into a hit TV series. But say you polish a manuscript and submit to literary agents. You receive a hundred rejections. Until at last an agent wants to represent you. Then you're on submission to acquisitions editors at publishing houses. But they might not want the manuscript. Even if the book is published, it could be a complete flop. And you might not earn out your advance, the money paid up front. Meaning you didn't sell enough copies, and your publisher might drop you. Success is not an escalator. It's pushing a rock up a hill over and over again. Only a tiny fraction of writers get published through the traditional route. Self-publishing is always an option, but it can be incredibly expensive, and every task falls on your shoulders. You're essentially running a small business. You might need to pay for the cover design, editing, formatting, advertising, and audiobook narrators. The return on investment for self-publishing is incredibly low, because producing a high-quality book often involves hiring experienced professionals. Dreams motivate us to pursue our goals, but we also need to set realistic expectations so we're not disappointed in the long run. Having a profitable full-time career as a fiction writer is possible, but it's also difficult. Difficult is good. Nothing is fun without a little bit of a challenge. I highly recommend Jane Friedman's The Business of Being a Writer for a great overview of how to navigate the publishing world and make a career from writing. If you're really passionate about writing fiction, do it for the joy it brings to your life rather than fame and fortune. After all, most people don't learn to play guitar in order to become chart-topping rock stars or play golf because they think they can be pro athletes with huge salaries. Write to better yourself and enrich your life. As fantasy author Neil Gaiman has said, So I decided that I'd do my best in future not to write books, just for the money. If you didn't get the money, then you didn't have anything. And if I did work I was proud of, and I didn't get the money, at least I'd have the work. The good news is that you can learn so much about writing for free, thanks to the People's University of Online Writing Gurus, library books, and critique groups. You don't need a college or even a high school diploma to be a writer. You don't need to read a thousand books or know someone in the publishing industry. All you need to do is tell a good story, and form a community of people who will support you on your journey. Grow thick skin when it comes to rejection, forget the haters, and dream big anyway. Key takeaway. Writing fiction probably won't make you rich, but it is a fulfilling, valuable, and meaningful endeavor. Most of these mistakes are due to a lack of knowledge. It's difficult to know what you don't know. Be open to learning, and try not to be too hard on yourself. These are problems that writers face no matter their experience level. And sometimes we have to relearn things as we go along. Many issues can be fixed through rewriting, so learning how to revise is a crucial skill to have in your literary arsenal. Keep a growth mindset, and know you always have the power to improve. Above all, don't let writing advice paralyze you into indecision. Write first, diagnose problems later, and learn from your experiences. When honing a skill, we rarely do things right on the first try. So take risks and fail big. Follow Neil Gaiman. And now go and make interesting mistakes. Make amazing mistakes. Make glorious and fantastic mistakes. Break rules. Leave the world more interesting for your being here. Make good art. What have you learned from your writing mistakes? Give me something to think about in the comments. Whatever you do, keep writing.